September last year, Lucy Elliott travelled across Georgia, a country that sits between the Middle East, Europe and Asia. And, as Lucy puts it, it's a land of cheese pies and grandmothers. Please welcome Lucy Elliott. It's one thing I've got to remember not to click the black button, so I'll try not to do that while I'm here. Um, anyway, good evening, everybody. Um, as you just heard, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my adventure across the land of cheese pies and grandmas. So, in September last year, I set off with my boyfriend James on a mini 11-day adventure across Georgia. Why Georgia? That's what most people asked us. Why are you travelling all the way to the US for 11 days? <laughs> no, not Georgia in America, but Georgia the country in Europe. Blank faces often remained. So why did I decide to go to Georgia? About a year ago, I came here to the RGS to listen to a guy called Rob Lilwall talk about walking across Mongolia. Totally inspired by what he said, I went away to read one of his other adventures with a guy called Al Humphreys, who was cycling across the world. The night I sat down on the sofa, trying to plan what the next adventure was going to be, I got to the point in the book where Al reached um, Georgia. He was totally exhausted at this point, but spoke about how wonderful the country was, how fantastic the people were, and the food was incredible. It sounded great to me. So Georgia it was. For those of you that don't know, Georgia very much sits in between Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. You've got Russia up towards the north, um, Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan down to the south. It's also really important to notice as well from this map, you can see two breakaway territories, um, and in particular South Ossetia, which I'm going to talk about later. Although Georgia doesn't recognize South Ossetia as a political entity that's separate, um, they did actually um, say that they were going separate from Georgia in 1990, and that's actually caused a lot of problems in the country. There's a lot of disputes around the borders. I think one thing I really noticed while I was traveling across the country was just how much Georgia's position sat in between Asia, Europe, and the Middle East really impacted on the landscape, the people, and the culture. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight, is really how has that influences, influenced Georgia's identity. I don't want to bore you too much with a history lecture, but I think it is important just to look back a little bit. Because of Georgia's position in this area, it's meant that it's been really easy to be invaded. This has been right back in the 7th century when it was invaded by the Arabs, up to more recently when, in 1920, it was invaded by Russia and became part of the Soviet Union right up until the late 20th century. You can even see here from this picture, um, this is the Russian army invading the North Caucasus Mountains. The first place that we landed was Sveni. This is up in the North Caucasus regions. I was absolutely fascinated by this landscape with all the tiny little towers that you can see dotted across the picture. The reason that these have been developed is actually to protect Georgia from invasion. And I was really impressed to find out that this area wasn't actually invaded until the late, 20th, um, late 19th century when it was hit by the Russians. What was really interesting is one of the families that we were staying with there said that they still get people today who come to them and offer money to be able to keep their valuables there because people are still scared of being invaded and they see this as one of the safest places in the whole country. Unfortunately, though, not all parts of Georgia's landscape which have remnants of its invasion have such positive connotations. As we moved further over towards the eastern Caucasus Mountains, we got to Steps Minda. That night when we sat in a pub, we got chatting to one of the locals. He said, you've got to go to Trousseau Valley. It's absolutely beautiful. It's known for its rare flowers and also these beautiful turquoise and orange lakes, which bubble due to the carbon dioxide in them. So that night, we packed our bags and set off early to go trekking in the valley. After about five hours of trekking through the heat, we saw up ahead what looked to be a village. Excellent, we thought, food. Absolutely starving, we sped up and moved a bit faster. It wasn't, however, until we got a bit closer, however, we realised that actually the village was deserted. We were quite confused, though, as this must have happened quite recently. There was still washing hung up on some of the lines in people's back gardens, and there were pigs scouting around looking for a bit of food. At this point, we realised we must have been a lot closer to the border with South Ossetia than we'd realised, 
And actually, this village had just recently been um, abandoned due to some local disruption that had happened between South Ossetians and local Georgians. Nevertheless, we decided that we were going to push on and see how close we could get to the border with Russia. It was only about three kilometers past this point, though, where we were stopped by Russian soldiers and asked to hand over our passports. We were, however, told that if we carried on any further, we would be put under arrest unless we could produce a packet of cigarettes. <laughs> if we could do that, they would let us up to a small fort that sat up on the hill where we could get a great view, but only for 10 minutes. I hadn't thought to put a packet of cigarettes in my bag that morning, <laughs> so sadly we had to turn around and walk back to the main highway. It really did hit me, though, however, that just how much influence Russia still has over the area, even though it doesn't occupy Georgia itself anymore. The babushka, otherwise known as grandma, is very much an iconic image in Georgia. I have to say for me though, the term babushka holds very much Soviet connotations of oppressed women who are made to stay at home, look after the family, and their only opportunities of having a job is to sit by the roadside and sell vegetables. This idea was however changed though, as one of the families that we stayed with, you can see Amma up here to the right, said that she didn't want to be called Amma, she wanted me to call her babushka, and this was because this was a term she was really proud of and she really wanted to stay and look after her family. And that was really important to her, which really changed the way in which I was thinking about the term. I did find it funny, though. Every babushka I met in Georgia didn't want to be seen as being old. Amma insisted before the photo was taken that she wanted to run up to the balcony so that I couldn't see her wrinkles. <laughs> and Pat over here was desperate for me not to see her gold set of teeth because that would give away her age. It's obvious across Georgia that the different influences that all the invasions have had have really had an influence on the culture and the people um, and the landscape. However, there are some things out there that I think really do remain Georgian and typical to Georgian identity, one of which is Supra, otherwise known as the Feast. When we were walking through one of the small villages called Bacho one evening, we came across this group of men sitting down to a Supra. Very puzzled by the two lost British people who stumbled into their backyard, they stared at us for a good five minutes, and then beckoned us over and insisted that we come to join. It didn't take much persuading for us. One of the most important parts of a supper is to have a toast. The toastmaker stands up at the start and gives toast to everything that's important. Family, friends, happiness, peace, the village, the farm, the pigs, the cows, the list goes on. In fact, it was about 20 minutes before James and I could clunk our glasses with the people next to us and sit down to eat. When the food did come, it came plentiful. Beautiful stews, meats, vegetables. It was all fantastic. The babushkas even ran off to create another three desserts because it was very important that as guests, we had a choice of sweet treats. <laughs> Homestays were a really important part of the trip for James and I. And it became clear that hospitality and homestays are also a massive part of Georgian culture and identity. Because we were mainly staying in rural areas, it meant that we couldn't rely on hotels. However, it soon became clear that no matter what town we turned up in, someone would bring us in and offer us a place to stay. If they couldn't look, look after us, they would know someone who did. I think it was really humbling to see that, despite the fact that Georgia has been hit and invaded by so many different countries around it, they would welcome in anyone. This family up here we were staying with in Kazbegi. When we went down to breakfast the next morning, we realised that a Russian family had come in during the night. Um, the Georgian family had stepped out of their room and let this Russian family come in. It was quite interesting because only the day before we'd been stopped by Russian soldiers just down, just down the road in the Trousseau Valley, yet they were so welcoming and hospitable. For me, staying with people is a fantastic way to reduce anxiety when you're travelling you get to really experience the culture, and also it's a great way to meet new people and enriches your overall experience. Finally, I couldn't finish without mentioning the Kachapuri. This is the calorific union of dairy and bread. <laughs> it's somewhat like a stuffed crust pizza, but the cheese runs all the way through it. It's then topped with cheese and butter and eggs. I can hand on heart say that I ate this at least two, if not three meals of every single day. <laughs> As one of the mothers said in the family to us, it's so important um, that a Georgian man has his kachapuri that he's not ready to start the day until he's had it. 
is actually such an important part of Georgian culture that measures in its um, fluctuations in the, its cost of production are actually measured, used to measure inflation in what's called the Kachapuri Index. <laughs> so, I have to say that it's obvious across Georgia that it's definitely been influenced by its neighbours from Europe, Asia and the Middle East. However, there are definitely parts of Georgian identity which remain the same and which are truly Georgian. On the last day when we sat in the bus station waiting for a bus that never actually arrived, we had plenty of time to chat to some of the people there. The lady who you can see at the back was telling us about what it meant to her to be Georgian. She really hoped that in the future Georgia would have an identity for itself and that it wouldn't be known for conflicts but actually known for a place of peace and hospitality. I think this is really reflected in Georgia's current fight to achieve NATO status and become recognised across the international community. And I've definitely got my fingers crossed for the country at the Warsaw Summit this year when we find out if um, Georgia can be accepted. Thank you.